Almighty God, we have come before thee this morning with grateful and thankful hearts. This morning for our graduates becomes that service, that time of worship that is both one of reflection and one of anticipation. We thank you, our Father, that you have guided us, each of us, through the years. We thank you for the provision that has been in Jesus Christ for not only the material needs, and they have been of necessity, but also for the spiritual needs that you have so richly endowed us with, some of it in the very form of our education, some of it in personal contact with other students, faculty, and friends. And all of it we trust through thy Spirit of God. We are thankful this day as well for the vision and purpose that you can and will give to each one. And that our direction and walk may be worthy of the high calling. And that you will continue to guide, O great Jehovah, as you have in days past. In the lives of each and every one of these, our graduates, as you have promised. We thank you for faculty that have invested of themselves and their lives in the teaching of the things of God and the whole counsel of God. We thank you for those on administrative staff that have in their way provided and given input. We thank you for family, a mate, a parent, or parents. And those that have prayed that we are not even aware of this morning for the success of our schooling and now for the success in your sight of our ministry. We thank you for what you are and who you are this day and for your continuous guidance upon us. And as the psalmist said and the hymn writer has par paraphrased, the king of love my shepherd is whose goodness faileth, faileth never. I nothing lack if I am his and he is mine forever. May that be our thought and prayer. And as we pray that prayer which was taught to your disciples, may it have rich meaning to us this morning. Our Father, Father who art in heaven, <coughs> hallowed be thy name. <coughs> thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give, give us this day our daily bread, and, and forgive us our debtors, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever.
console, as to console, to be understood, as to understand, to be loved, as to love, for it is in a giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we It is a rich privilege for us to welcome to this campus again today a friend of the Divinity School, one who has given his life in ministry to students, and a pastor, Dr. John R. W. Stott. The scripture text on which Dr. Stott's address is based will be read for us from Acts 2 by Mark Hunt, a member of the graduating class. And as Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and to your children and to all that are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to him. And he testified with many other words and exhorted them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they sold their possessions and goods and distributed them to all, as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they partook of food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number, day by day, those who were being saved. Well, it's great uh, for me to be back at Trinity, and I would like to thank you for the kindness and the warmth that you give uh, me as a kind of peripatetic presbyter uh, whenever I return uh, to Trinity. It's a very great pleasure for me because I have many friends on the faculty and indeed still in the student body. And I'm also very grateful for the invitation to speak uh, at your baccalaureate service. Uh, naturally, we have specially in mind at this service those who are graduating. We congratulate them. We wish them the fullness of God's blessing in their future. Some of you I know who are graduating will become pastors of the church. All of you will be members and servants of the church. And for that reason, it seemed to me appropriate that we should think together about the church, and in particular, some contemporary challenges to the Christian church. Now, I realize that uh, we may have, to some extent, different ecclesiologies, but I think that we shall be agreed, as we think together, about the opportunities and the challenges that confront the church today. In my conviction, one of the great needs of the Christian church is sensitivity. If we are true followers of Jesus Christ, if we share something of his compassion, 
then we shall keep our eyes open to what is happening in the world around us. We shall keep our ears cocked to the world's cries of pain. And we shall be sensitive to the real issues in the world today and seek to respond to them sensitively. In my view, the church seldom does that. It seems that instead we run the risk, as indeed has often been said, of answering questions nobody's asking, scratching where nobody's itching, offering goods that nobody wants, in other words, of being totally irrelevant. And far too often in the church's long history, it has been out of touch with the real world outside. Not because the church has been distinctive, the church must always be distinctive, preserving its own distinct Christian identity. I'm not con calling for conformity to the world. But what I'm talking about is not the distinctiveness of the church, which must always remain, but the insensitivity of the church. When it is tragically unaware and culpably indifferent to the pain and agony of the world outside. I want then to bring to you in this baccalaureate address a threefold quest of modern men and women. A quest that only Jesus Christ is able to satisfy. A quest that challenges the church to proclaim Jesus in his biblical fullness and demonstrate the all-sufficiency of Jesus Christ to meet the needs, the aspirations of mankind. And the church needs to demonstrate Christ in his fullness, not only in its message, but in its whole lifestyle. Firstly, then, there is the quest for transcendence. <coughs> Until recent years, the word transcendence was a rather pedantic one, the preserve of theologians in Trinity and other seminaries who liked to discourse with great learning about transcendence and imminence and the difference between the two and God above us and God among us and so on. But no longer is this the case since the word became popularized by the craze for transcendental meditation. Nowadays the man in the street knows well what transcendence means or at least has some concept of it. And we would define this quest for transcendence as a search for a reality that is above and beyond the material world. There can be no doubt, can there, that the world around us, at least the Western world, is a very secular and a very materialistic world. I know a Christian professor in London University, now mm -hmm. retired, who was so wise that all his friends knew him as Socrates, and who worked in one of the big uh, London teaching hospitals, and found himself so surrounded by materialism that he said to me one day, I work in an atmosphere so materialistic that the word spirit is never mentioned unless prefixed by the adjective method. Now this is the modern materialistic world, a world of machines and computers, a world of science and of technology, and to the scientific secularist it is a closed system complete in itself and God is being bowed out of modern materialistic man's universe until he becomes, in T.H. Huxley's well-known phrase, the last fading smile on the face of a cosmic Cheshire cat. Now, it is this secularized world against which so many young people today are rebelling. Thank God they are. Materialism doesn't satisfy them. They are discovering the truth that Jesus spoke long ago, that man does not live by bread only, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. If you've read uh, Theodore Rozak's Making of a Counterculture, now a bit out of date, it's true, as it documented the counterculture of the 1960s. To me, the most uh, important chapter in his book is the one entitled The Myth of an Objective Consciousness. 
in which he speaks of how people brought up in scientific secularism have been taught objectivity, objective consciousness, and as we look through our microscopes and telescopes, eliminating ourselves as the subject in our contemplation of the object and all that. Young people are rebelling, he says, against that because they realize that reality with the capital R, whatever it may be, is something awesomely versed, something that cannot be comprehended at the end of our scientific instruments, something that cannot be smeared on a slide and put into a microscope uh, and, be, and be made the object of microscopic investigation something that cannot be confined in a test tube. They are convinced that there is another dimension, a spiritual dimension to life, which they call transcendence. And they are seeking it everywhere, through mind-expanding drugs, through yoga, transcendental meditation, higher consciousness, sexual adventures, science fiction, art, music, <coughs> experiments with the occult, the whole youth culture seeking transcendence. Now, we Christians understand what they are doing. In Pauline language, they are feeling after God, groping after their creator who made them in his own image for himself and allows them to remain restless till they find their rest in him. In a word, they are seeking God, recognizing the need for worship. Dostoevsky put it so admirably, the one essential condition of human existence is that man should always be able to bow down before something infinitely great. If men are deprived of the infinitely great, they will not go on living but die of despair. Or you know Peter Schaffer's play, Equus, and you know how Alan Strang, the 17-year-old boy, passing through a period of adolescent uh, religiousness, who had a picture of the suffering Christ in his bedroom, until his atheist father replaced it with a picture of a horse, Equus, to which or to whom Alan transferred his worship. Until in the end, although the play begins there, you probably know, Alan blinds six horses in the stable, and the magistrate sends him to the psychiatrist, Martin Dysart. And Dysart knows the emptiness of his own existence, and he envies Alan Strang, the boy, because of his passionate obsession. And Martin Dysart said, I've never felt anything like this. I'm jealous of him. The psychiatrist jealous of his own patient. And when the magistrate keeps coming to Dysart saying, can't you rid the boy of his pain? Dysart said, I can't rid him of his pain without ridding him of his passion. And he said, is there anything worse that you can do to anybody than take away their worship? And the most significant phrase in the play, without worship, you shrink. There is no humanity without worship. So that is the first challenge to the Christian church. It is a challenge to our Christian worship. Does our worship, the worship of our local churches, offer people what instinctively they are seeking? The element of mystery, the sense of the numinous, in biblical language, the fear of God, an awareness of the reality of the living God, the transcendent become <laughs> imminent, God in the midst of his people, so that we bow down before him in that mixture of awe and joy and wonder that we call worship. To my own questions, I think I have to answer not often do our churches offer that experience? We evangelicals don't know much about worship. Evangelism is our speciality, not worship. We have little sense of the greatness of God. We tend to be cocky and flippant and conceited 
We take little trouble to prepare our worship services. Though, if I may say so in parenthesis, I'm thankful for the trouble that has been taken in preparing this service this morning. But so many of our services are slovenly, mechanical, perfunctory, and dull. And we need to listen again to the biblical criticism of religion. The Old Testament prophets, of course, were scathing in their denunciation of the formalism and the hypocrisy of Israelite worship. And Jesus applied their critique to the Pharisees of his own day. This people draw near to me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And I fear, my brothers and sisters, I fear that the indictment of religion that we find both in the Old Testament prophets and in the teaching of Jesus is uncomfortably applicable to much of our evangelical worship today. Too much of it is ritual without reality, form without power, religion without God. So what is needed? <clears throat> I've time only to mention a few suggestions before I pass to the second quest. We need such a faithful reading of God's word in public worship and such a faithful exposition of God's word that it is God himself who is heard addressing his people with a living voice today. We need also such a reverent and believing administration of the Lord's Supper that there is a real presence of Jesus Christ. Oh, no, not indeed in the elements, but in the congregation and at the table. Jesus Christ himself, objectively, really present, coming to meet his people, making himself known through the breaking of bread, offering himself to his people again that we may feed upon him in our hearts by faith. And such a humble offering of prayer and such a joyful singing of praise so that every worship service is a celebration of the mighty acts of God in Christ that God's people say again with Jacob, surely God is in this place and I knew it not. And this is the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. And that when unbelievers come in, they fall down and worship God, saying, God is really in your midst. In brief, it is a tragic fact that young people seeking transcendence today turn to drugs and sex and yoga and mysticism instead of to the church, in whose worship true transcendence ought regularly to be experienced. That's the first challenge to the contemporary church, the quest for transcendence. The second is the quest for significance. Now, the modern technocracy, as we know, has not only quenched our sense of transcendence, it's diminished our sense of significance. And there is so much in modern life that is dreadfully dehumanizing. And men, women, and children no longer feel themselves to be persons with human dignity, but to borrow a phrase from Toynbee, serial numbers punched on a card designed to travel through the entrails of a computer. And some scientists from different disciplines are arguing that a human being is nothing but a machine programmed to make automatic responses to external stimuli, nothing but an animal, to be precise, a naked ape. And it is this that has prompted Professor Donald Mackay, whose books I hope you'll read, to coin the expression nothing buttery and to protest against every tendency to reduce human beings to the level of nothing but this or nothing but that, nothing but a machine, nothing but an animal. Now, of course, our brain is a machine, a highly complex mechanism. And our body, our anatomy and our physiology are those of an animal. 
but that is not a complete account of our humanness. And to say that we're nothing but a machine and nothing but an animal is, of course, to make a dangerous and serious mistake. Is this the reason for the increase of suicides? I read in an article in one of our papers in uh, Britain, and I've not yet been able to check it for accuracy over here. You may know the source of this. The report in your country that suicide among American adolescents is the second leading cause of death in the population. And this article described it as having reached epidemic proportions, so that last year 35,000 young people were officially listed as having killed themselves, while teachers in university and high school believe that the true figure may be near 100,000. People kill themselves because they have no significance, nothing to live for. Life has no meaning. It is empty and meaningless. And once again, people are protesting against this, and rightly so. I very much hope all of you have read Dr. Viktor Frankl's remarkable little book, Man's Search for Meaning. You know that Viktor Frankl is the founder of what has come to be known as the Third Viennese School of Psychiatry, and is, I think, still professor of psychiatry and neurology in the University of uh, Vienna. And he spent three years in Auschwitz and other Nazi concentration camps and learned there that the people with the greatest capacity to survive those appalling experiences were people who had something to live for, something to survive for. So he developed what he now calls logotherapy, taking logos now as uh, signifying meaning, and he writes, the striving to find a meaning in one's life is the primary motivational force in men and women. And so he has developed alongside Freud's will to pleasure and Adler's will to power what he calls a will to meaning. And without significance, human beings simply cannot live and thrive. Now, how is that a challenge to the Christian church? <clears throat> I want to suggest that as the quest for transcendence is a challenge to our Christian worship and its quality, the quest for significance is a challenge to our Christian <clears throat> teaching. That is to say, there are millions of people today who don't know who they are, and it's our responsibility to tell them who they are, to enlighten them about their human identity and to teach the full biblical doctrine of man, mankind. Because only Christians believe in the intrinsic worth of human beings. Others say they do, at least Christians are the only people who have any reason to believe in the intrinsic worth of human beings. Because only Christians have an adequate doctrine of creation and of redemption, that God made man in his own image, male and female, he created them in his own image. And human beings are godlike beings, with capacities that set us apart forever from the lower animal creation. Oh, of course we are fallen, but we know that the fall has not destroyed the divine image in which we were and have been made. We still bear the image of our Creator, and beyond that, God loved his creation. He loved the world and gave his only son to redeem mankind. William Temple, the former Archbishop of Canterbury, who died during the Second World War, put it, my worth is what I'm worth to God. And that is a marvelous great deal because Christ died for me. Now, Christian teaching on the dignity and the nobility and the intrinsic worth of men and women, which we need to teach in its full, <clears throat> biblical, unashamed, insistent nature, is of the utmost importance today, not only for our own self-image, but also for the whole of society. I wonder if I'm exaggerating if I say this to you. I don't think I am. That when human beings are devalued, Everything in society goes sour. Women and children are devalued. The sick are regarded as a nuisance and the elderly as a burden. 
Capitalism displays its most ugly face. Labor is exploited in the mines and the factories. Criminals are brutalized in prison. Opposition opinions are stifled. Belson is invented by the extreme right and gulag by the extreme left. Unbelievers are left to die in their lostness. And human life is not worth living because it's scarcely human any longer. There is no freedom, no dignity, no carefree joy because human beings are despised and devalued. But conversely, when human beings are valued because of their intrinsic worth, the sick in mind and body are cared for. The elderly are permitted to live in dignity and die with dignity. Women and children are given the honor that is due to them. Dissidents in the community are listened to. Prisoners are rehabilitated. Workers are given a fair wage and decent conditions and participation in the ordering of their job. The gospel is taken to the furthest corners of the earth. Why? Because people matter. Because men and women have significance made in the image of God and as the objects of the love of God. So this is our business, to teach the full doctrine of what it means to be a human being. And without that, people lose significance. Now, why don't they have this sense of significance? Isn't it our fault? Isn't it the church's fault? It's no good blaming other people. It's because they haven't learned from us who they are. Challenge to Christian worship, a challenge to Christian teaching. And I finish thirdly <clears throat> with the quest for community. The modern technocratic society, which has destroyed transcendence and significance, is destructive also of community. Before Look magazine folded some years ago, I read an article in which an observer of American life described it in these terms. Dehumanization is a patent fact of life. Loneliness increases as the machine, symbolized by the computer, takes over America and week by week decreases human contacts. Automatic elevators, drive-in banking without visible human tellers, television check-ins at motels, recorded voices on the telephone or issue com issuing commands and advice from the ceiling or the walls, television lectures to huge classes and universities, my own pessimism, says the writer, is linked to the machine's relentless march across the land, mutilating the green hills, paving the valleys, fouling the sweet air, contaminating the waters and forcing people to spend their working hours tending the very mechanical contrivances which are supposed to serve them. The machine does give something in return, comfort and convenience, and for these twin sirens, a nation's soul is being lost. I don't know anybody who has put it better than Bertrand Russell in his early days in a book that is little read called The Impact of Science on Society, where he complains of citizens being turned into the cogs of a machine and says that in time men and women will pray to the machine in words of a kind of Episcopal general confession. Almighty and most merciful machine, we have erred and strayed from thy ways like lost screws. <laughs> we have put in those nuts that we ought not to have put in, and we have left out those nuts that we ought to have put in, and there is no cogginess in us. <laughs> and Russell goes on, this really won't do. The idolatry of the machine is an abomination. The machine as an object of adoration is the modern form of Satan and its worship the modern diabolism. So what is the answer, he asks, and gives this extraordinary reply. The root of the matter is this, a very simple and old-fashioned thing, a thing so simple that I'm almost ashamed to mention it for fear of the derisive smile with which wise cynics will greet my words. The thing I mean, please forgive me for mentioning it. 
is love, Christian love or compassion. If you feel this, he says, you will never know the deep despair of those whose life is aimless and void of purpose. The quest for community. So people in our day and generation are protesting against the loss of community. There are many who are breaking away from Western individualism in favor of communal styles of living. Others are enriching their family life by replacing the nuclear family, traditional in the West, with the extended family that has been traditional in Asia and Africa for decades, centuries. And all are searching, searching for community, searching for authentic relationships of human love. And this too, my friends, is a challenge to the Christian church. It is a challenge to the quality of our Christian fellowship. But Jesus Christ offers true community. He came to make peace, not only between God and man, not only between Jew and Gentile, but between ordinary people with one another. His purpose was not to save isolated individuals in order then to perpetuate their loneliness and alienation. His purpose was to build a church to build a new community, a new society. And he means his church to be the true alternative society, challenging the value system of secular community, being what one English writer has called an embodied question mark. Because it is querying, scrutinizing, challenging the accepted values of society outside, and offering a new and a superior value system. To borrow the words of St. Francis, so beautifully sung before I spoke, Jesus Christ intends us, where there is hatred, to sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is distrust, faith. Where there is sorrow, hope. And where there is darkness, light. And the tragedy again is that the church has constantly failed to live up to this ideal of Jesus Christ. Do I exaggerate? I don't think so. There is so little acceptance, so little love, so little caring, supportive community in our evangelical churches today. People searching for community ought to be pouring into our churches. Instead, the church is usually the one place in which they don't even bother to look for it. So convinced are they that they will not find it. I've sometimes quoted Professor Herbert Maurer, whose name will be familiar to all of you, the Emeritus Professor of Psychiatry in the University of Illinois, <coughs> well-known critic of Freud, <coughs> author of many books, founder of uh, Integrity Therapy, not a Christian by his own admission, not even a theist, very critical of the church. And when some friends and I asked to see him a few years ago, he said to us that he had a lover's quarrel with the church. He said, that's an interesting expression. What do you mean by it? Well, he said, the church failed me when I was a teenager, and it continues to fail my patients today. But in what way, we said, has the church failed you? And then he said this, the church has never learned the secret of community. Now, I think that's unfair. I think his experience must have been very unfortunate. There are some churches that have learned the secret of community, but that was his considered opinion. And he told us that when he wanted to send somebody into a community that would accept, support, and love them, he had to send them to Alcoholics Anonymous he would never send them to a church. I think that is the most damaging, the most devastating criticism of the church I've ever heard. So we've got to work at this community because where true Christian love is to be found, it has a magnetism that is all but irresistible. Bishop Stephen Neal has expressed it beautifully, I think, in one of his books, if I may quote him for a moment, within the fellowship of those who are bound together by personal loyalty to Jesus Christ, the relationship of love 
reaches an intimacy and intensity that is found nowhere else. Friendship between the friends of Jesus of Nazareth is unlike any other friendship. And this ought to be the normal experience within the Christian community, that in existing Christian congregations it is so rare, he says, is a measure of the failure of the church as a whole to live up to the purpose of its founder for it. But where it is experienced, especially across the barriers of race, nationality, and language, it is one of the most convincing evidences of the continuing activity of Jesus among men. So I conclude. I've tried to bring you what I believe to be three of the most insistent and urgent quests of modern men and women. And although they may not be able to articulate them, though they may not even understand them, looking for transcendence, they are trying to find God. Looking for significance, they are trying to find themselves and looking for community, they are trying to find their neighbor. And this is the universal human quest, the quest for our God, our neighbor, and ourselves. And Christians dare to say that this quest will lead them to only one place, and that is Christ and his church. Thus the modern quest constitutes one of the greatest challenges and one of the greatest opportunities that have ever faced mankind. People are actively looking for the very things that Jesus Christ offers. The only question is whether the church can rise to this moment of opportunity. It did at the beginning. That's why I asked for that passage to be read in Acts 2, where the new spirit-filled believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, and the breaking of bread and the prayers. That is, in those early days, the worship was real, the teaching was thorough, the fellowship was caring. And these three marks of a spirit-filled church were clearly seen in those early days. The question is, can the church be radically renewed? The answer is in your hands, the hands of those who are graduating and many others who belong to your generation and are leaving the seminaries of this decade. Can it be so radically renewed by the word of God and by the spirit of God that it offers a true experience of transcendence in its living worship, of personal significance, of loving community, then people will turn to the church in their quest. Our proclamation of the gospel will no longer lack credibility. And we shall present Jesus Christ in his fullness as the answer to all human aspirations. Now, in a moment, Dean Cancer will lead us in the prayer of the people. But before he comes, let us be quiet and pray together. <laughs> And I would like us to be silent. We've been perhaps very critical of the church, which means we're critical of ourselves, for we are members of the church. And it's no good pointing the finger at others if we don't point it at ourselves. So let's confess our sin and failure, the failures of the churches to which we belong and pray both for forgiveness and for grace to make amends in silence. Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you for your church throughout the world, 
and for the privilege of being members of it. And yet we confess with tears and shame how far we fall short of the beautiful ideal that you have set us in your word. We pray that you will radically renew your church by your word and by your spirit. And if it please you as we offer ourselves to you in this baccalaureate service, make us instruments of reform and renewal for the glory of your great and worthy name. Amen. Shall we unite in prayer? Our Heavenly Father, we come into thy presence with a deep sense of awe at the greatness of thy majesty and with an even deeper sense of wonder that thou, who art the great God of all this vast universe, who had only to speak and to bring vast worlds into being, that thou dost still choose to manifest thy presence in our midst, here, in this tiny corner of our little planet. Above all else, we are filled with gratitude for the boundless grace and love that caused thee to send into this world thine only begotten Son our Lord Jesus Christ. All that we are and all that we have, we owe to him. On this day especially, we are reminded of the goodness of thy providence in our lives. And we confess with shame how lightly we have taken thy daily provision, not only of our physical needs, but of the constant provision for our personal and spiritual needs, and especially thy care of this precious body we call the church. We pray for thy forgiveness for thy church and for ourselves. Forgive us of the sin <coughs> in which we have committed wrongs that bring disgrace to thy body. Forgive us <coughs> of the sins whereby we have in lethargy failed by omission to do the things that we know are most important, most need to be done, and are most clearly thy will. Forgive us, our Father, as a needy and repentant church recognizing that only as thou dost forgive can we dare to take another step. And now we thank thee specially for these young men and women who have been called to various ministries 
in thy church. We thank thee for their abilities. We thank thee for the grace that has brought them through arduous preparation to this day. And now we thank thee for this baccalaureate service, for the warning that we have heard from thy word, and the exhortation that appropriately followed it, and for the resources of thy word that enable us to meet these challenges to our Christian faith. We thank thee too for the new tasks that are opening before our graduates. We know that we are utterly inadequate to meet them, but we also know the greatness of the resources that thou hast in thine infinite power and that thou hast made available in thy grace through our Lord Jesus and his redemptive love for each one of us. Our special prayer for this day is that thou wilt anoint us as a body, a portion of thy church, and especially these graduates by thy Holy Spirit. And do each of them, we pray, with a full measure of grace so that they may richly and abundantly respond to thy calling. Pour out upon each of us thy Holy Spirit as thou hast done in time past. Fill us for each day's task and the special and critical tasks that we face day by day in our lives. Enable us to represent our Lord Jesus Christ faithfully and well and to respond sensitively as he did to the felt needs and the real needs of a suffering, hungry, and lost humanity crying out for help. Comfort us, we pray, in adversities. Give courage to our graduates as they face special problems in their service and ministries for thee. Give them spiritual discernment in a day when sharp distinctions and keen discernment often have low premiums placed upon them. Give us, we pray, and our graduates especially, a willingness to take seriously thine instructions that judgment may begin in the house of God, thy house, the house that we are, and that thereby applying thine instruction faithfully to ourselves first, we may seek the forgiveness and then the enablement and then the courage to go out into the tasks to which thou hast called us. And we pray too, Lord, that thou wilt give these students joy as they go out to minister and to serve Jesus Christ. Thou art a great God. We thank thee for the immense privilege of belonging to thee, of representing thee, of serving thee, of worshiping thee. Fill our hearts with the joy that is ours, ours by grace, by right of grace, so that as we go about our tasks, we may do so 
with that joy and gladness of the gospel built into our lives as we represent in this world in which thou hast placed us and to which thou hast sent us the Savior who loves infinitely and completely all men everywhere and help us that we may be filled with that like consuming passionate love for thee and through thee and because of thee to all men and women and children everywhere pour out now upon us anew thy grace to cleanse us, to refresh us, to empower us, to send us forth, and to use us in the fields of this world. That in the words of the scripture are ripe unto harvest and need the harvesters. This day we commit ourselves unto thee now in the name of our blessed Savior, our great God and King, Jesus Christ, whose we are and to whom we belong for now and all eternity. Amen. You will note that at the conclusion of the singing of the hymn, Lord of Our Life, we'll again be seated for the playing of the postlude. The prelude and the postlude are not unfortunate logistic appendages at either end of our worship, but integral parts of our worship itself, opportunities to continue our reflection and hearing of the Word of God, opportunities to express our praise and our thanks to God, particularly for His creative gifts in the lives of those who lead us by composing and by playing. 